This is the rambling reporter speaking. We're on our way to Borneo to look for the famous wild man. Borneo is in the Dutch East Indies, just south of the Philippines. It's the third largest island in the world and one of the least known. A great part of Borneo has never even been explored by white men. And when it comes to making movies there, well, that's an almost impossible job. The damp climate spoils most of your film, and the headhunting wild man may turn up at any moment and spoil the whole party. We begin at the town of Sandakan, which is under British rule. But when we go ashore, we find that most of its people are Chinese. The Chinese, you know, are the great shopkeepers of the Far East. Go where you like, you'll always find a Chinaman doing business and making money. Now this particular street in Sandakan is lined with gambling farms. They call them gambling farms because the concession is farmed out by the government. Well, perhaps we'll run across our wild man of Borneo, where the wild betting goes on. Let's go in and have a look-see. No, this doesn't seem so very wild. They're playing fan-tan, the old reliable Chinese gambling game, the simplest game on earth. To play it, you only need to be able to count up to four and know how to push your cash around with chopsticks. It's something like put and take. You do the putting, and the man who runs the gambling farm does the taking. It's not very exciting, but it does well enough in a climate where the temperature runs to 100 in the shade. A wild man of Borneo is not in sight. Perhaps he saw this old man who runs the gambling farm and went the other way. Out in the street in the broiling sun, the British policeman imported all the way from India keeps an eye on the fantan racket, and three more officers keep an eye on the governor's house. And perhaps that's just as well. The governor seems to be entertaining a family of wild men, and here they are in their party clothes. They brought their weapons along just in case the party gets wild. These natives belong to a race known as Dayak. And before the British took control of North Borneo, they made a business of collecting human heads and hanging them up to dry. And here's the wife of the wild man of Borneo who believes in bigger and better earrings. In order to carry these enormous brass rings, she cuts holes in her earlobes and lets them stretch down to her shoulders. Now we consider these people rather primitive, and it's somewhat of a surprise to find out that the wild man of Borneo invented the pocket cigarette lighter. Not having any pockets in his trousers, he carries it in a small leather bag. But in one respect, it's just like our own lighter, you see. It never works the first time. This introduction to the wild man makes us curious to see him in his native lair. So we'll go up the river where there's not so much civilization. Now this steamer doesn't offer much in the way of travel comfort, but after all, this is Borneo, and it isn't every day that we get to such a far off corner of the world. The only means of communication are the rivers, so you either travel by boat or cut your way through the jungles, taking your chance with the savage tribes who still like a little headhunting when the police are looking the other way. What civilization exists in Borneo is found along these rivers. Villages made up of wooden huts, generally built on piles, driven into the edge of the water. And the natives go up and down stream in canoes, shaded from the tropical sun by big mushroom hats made of straw. The climate, well, it resembles a Turkish bath. It rains nearly every day, and in between showers the sun comes out and fries the whole landscape. When you make movies in Borneo, you need a raincoat and an asbestos cover for your camera. We travel upstream for 60 miles or so, and then leave the steamer and go ashore for a sample of the native village life. We're greeted by the young men who spend most of their time playing war games and dancing. The women do all of the real work, and one of their principal jobs is weaving mats. Every village has its pigs and chickens, and they play an important part in the religion of the natives. 
Before doing anything important, such as planting crops or making war, the chiefs of the village ask the advice of the gods. To do this, they sacrifice a pig and a chicken, believing that the soul of the animal will carry their prayers to the tribal deity. The answer to the prayer is supposed to appear in the liver of the dead pig. First the men, and then the women, dance around the sacrifice. In the outskirts of the village, we find a typical two-family house built on stilts to protect it against floods and tiger cats. And in these homely surroundings, we see how the native mother looks after her young hopeful. And then we watch her put him in the oldest type of cradle in the world. It's the thing she uses to rock baby to sleep so she can enjoy her cigarette. But these village people are not so very well. So we'll take to the tall timber and look for excitement. And here, our native guide shows us how the Borneo traveler gets his drinking water. Cool, fresh, and free from malaria germs. You see, he finds it stored away in a hollow vine. And out here in the bush, we'll find our wild man in his native lair. Here he is, and he shows us how he does his hunting with a blowpipe that shoots poison darts and brings down the birds and monkeys, the wild man's favorite dish. The blowpipe is eight feet long. It has a range of 70 yards. It's accurate as a rifle in the hands of the wild man of Borneo. He holds it by one end, as steady as a rock. He gives one quick puff of air and sends silent death through the jungle. You know, the wild man of Borneo is not the kind of chap we'd care to meet on a dark night. Well, next door to the wild man lives his cousin, the orangutan. The jungle man, as the natives call him. And here he comes, rolling through the bush. The orang is the only animal that seems to have some idea of wearing clothes. Mrs. Orang often covers herself with leaves, and she doesn't do this because she's a lady, but simply because she's an orangutan. And these great apes are quite like human beings in many respects. You see, they go in for necking in a small way, when they find a convenient parking place in the jungle. They're more, they're more affectionate than the average human couple. The orangutan is a native of Borneo. He sometimes reaches a height of five feet, and his arms almost touch the ground. He fears no animal in the jungle, and he sometimes kills a crocodile by pulling its jaws apart with his powerful hands. But he has rather a sad and kindly face, and it's possible to tame him if you begin when he is very young. So when you travel in Borneo, if you have nerve and patience, you may succeed in trapping your young orangutan. And then you can bring him into camp and get on friendly terms with him. He's not a bad little fellow, the young orangutan. He soon begins to pick up human habits. Of course, his table manners aren't the best in the world, but considering he never read the book of etiquette, he gets along fairly well, and he's so serious about everything he does that it makes him all the funnier. In fact, the orangutan always proves to be the life of the party, while the wild man of Borneo, well, he may prove to be the death of it. And summing up the people we've met in Borneo, as we go back down the river, the Chinese gambler, the wild man and the ape, we decide that we'd rather take our chances with the orangutan, the original jungle man.